Days four, five, and six literarily and thematically recapitulate days one, two, and three. Here's a breakdown of the framework hypothesis. So the argument goes, the author intentionally presents the creation week through a literary structure of two triads of days. I'll put a chart up as I communicate this because I think it'll help. The argument goes, God created creature kingdoms on days one, two, and three, and then the creature kings on days four, five, and six who rule over the creature kingdoms of days one, two, and three. So for example, on day two, God separated the waters above, right, the air, and then the waters below. And then on day five, wouldn't you know it, God creates the rulers of that space. So the birds and the sea creatures. So Answers in Genesis attacks this position on multiple fronts. For example, they'll say things like the waters weren't created on day two. They were actually created on day one because we see that the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And that takes place all the way back in verse two. But to be frank, I kind of think that this counter argument misfires because they're employing what feels like surveillance footage hermeneutics, right? Finding meaning in the recreation of the events that are found in Genesis 1. But the point of the argument is that the author is employing a literary device intentionally, right? On day two, God does something with the water, right? He organizes them. And now that they're ordered, they're suitable for the birds and the fish to occupy. So that's the underlying point here. Now, there's two underlying assumptions of the framework hypothesis. Number one, the days of Genesis 1 are literary devices. So point being, two things are true at the same time. On the one hand, the author is presenting real history. But on the other, the author isn't concerned primarily with whether or not these are exact 24-hour solar days. Again, the author is employing a literary device to communicate the significance of what's happening. And he's doing so with language that you and I can understand. Assumption number two, when paired side by side with ancient creation texts, it's clear that the author is crafting an apologetic for the creator God and against the gods of the nations. So for example, the author doesn't even name the sun and the moon in the creation account in Genesis 1. Why? Well, because the ancient people worshipped the sun in the moon. Neglecting to mention their names could have been an apologetic against the pagan neighboring beliefs. And here's the point again. The author is doing more within the text than merely providing hour by hour camera footage. So what about you? When you look at the text of Genesis 1, do the two triads make sense to you? Whether yes or no, let me know in the comment section below. And if you have greater clarity on the framework hypothesis, like this video because it lets the YouTube algorithm know that this video is serving people. Now, I'm sure that you have more questions on Genesis 1, 2, and 3, which is why I'm consistently adding to this playlist over here. Check it out and let's keep learning together.